Thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, hopefully it's not rainy, cold, and dark like it is for me where I'm at. I'm in the West Coast. Hopefully it's nice and warm and sunny wherever you are. Today, uh, the webinar is brought to you by Intuit, of course, from the future. And then I'm from Carbon. Just go through a little bit about that in a minute. Today's topic, we are going to be talking about the three processes you must have to scale your practice. Uh, this is actually a really fun topic, uh, one that I'm really excited about, one I'm also super passionate about. We've been on the road for the Firm of the Future Roadshow. Hopefully we saw you there um, as we did the 25 city tour this fall. But uh, one of the things that came up time and time again was really understanding the core processes that you have and understanding how to be able to drive your firm to the next level by being able to scale those processes, improve them, um, and then modernize them as we go. So for those of you that are part of the QuickBooks Pro Advisor program or on the QuickBooks online uh, education journey, um, it looks like this. If you've uh, joined us for one of those Firm of the Future events, it's a starting point. But if you want to get QuickBooks online training, um, you start with fundamentals. If you're already certified or you want to get certified, then you can move on to advanced certification. If you want to do any of these courses and so forth, go to qbtraininginvents.com and you can find one that's either live in person near you or um, you can go to one of the online ones at any time. Um, great, great education, um, great things to learn and to become more proficient. Also notice there's that time of year, it's CPE credit time for those of you trying to get by the end of the year. Great way to be able to, to bolster up your CPE credits if you need to. Which is brings up a good point to today's webinar. There is a CPE credit up for grabs today. Typically we do a challenge keyword, but we are going to do polling questions. There are going to be four polling questions as we go through. Um, I'll put them in place, answer, and then at the end, um, once you've completed the four, uh, you can get yourself the CPE based on the follow-up survey. Before we get started, a few tips and tricks along the way. We are using GoToWebinar today. Um, there's that orange button. You can, command, you can collapse or expand uh, the control panel with that. I suggest closing down Zoom, Skype, any of those fun programs. Um, otherwise, it slows your connection. I will try to get questions as we go. I'll bring the questions window up right now. Um, and feel free to ask them along the way as we go through the, the content for today. Who is the lovely speaker that's speaking to you today? My name is Ian Vason. I'm a co-founder and vice president of product marketing um, at Carbon. My email is there, ian at carbonhq. If you feel, feel free to email me if you've got a question uh, or you want me to follow up. Overall, or just some background, um, I've been, you know, we founded Carbon a couple of years ago. I used to work uh, for Intuit for almost 10 years. Uh, I used to lead the Pro Advisor program and worked on various different uh, product lines across QuickBooks. Uh, and I've been in the profession for about 15 plus years and in technology and the like for over 25. So a little bit of context. And specifically on what we're talking about today, I am by trade an industrial engineer. And part of that and what I did was building the processes for some of the larger firms in the world. Um, and so uh, what I'm sharing with you today is a lot of what I've learned over the years. Uh, and again, processes are key to being able to drive your business overall. If you're interested in more information, um, we're going to talk about going to firmofthefuture.com uh, to do that. But if also, if you want to learn more content like today's uh, around processes, change management, whatever it might be, you can go and check it out at Carbon as well at carbonhq.com backslash editions or any of the webinars that we have there. Again, um, we just relaunched our next magazine. So if you want to know about how to transform your practice and double profit, um, check that out. Today we're not doing a demo on Carbon, just want to go quickly through it. Um, again, Carbon is the practice growth engine for accountants. If you want to learn more, go to CarbonHQ.com. And it basically brings all of your communications into one place, allowing you to be able to see timelines and, and details on contacts and client organizations, putting all of your work within one purview to then be able to manage how it's done over your firm um, and be able to do the processes and so forth in order to execute it overall. So again, if you want to learn more, go ahead and check it at carbonhq.com. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this, this is for CPE. We do have a credit up there. So let's go ahead and launch that poll for those folks that they're looking for CPE. The faster you answer, the faster I can move on in the content. So the firminthefuture.com website is fantastic. They're actually updating a lot of the content um, and, and putting more up day by day. So I just want to get a feel out there so I can pass it on to those guys. 
you know, what are the five different groups of uh, information would you like to see more of or like to see practice growth, process improvement, technology, strategy, and vision setting, uh, and implementing change. So I'm going to give it a few more seconds. Three, two, one. I'm going to close the poll. Let's just share those out. Uh, Wild on practice growth. Second, they're tied with process improvement and technology. Uh, strategy and vision setting, not so highly voted. So anyways, we've got three more polling sections as we go, so um, you get a little bit more fun along the way. So let's get into today's content, shall we? Three processes um, to scale your practice. So what we're going to cover today is first I want to get a little bit of an overview about how we got to these three core processes and why they're important and how they all blend and work together. Then we're going to talk a little bit about process improvement and change management. I think it's really important to get a base understanding of how you can do process improvement, what are the steps to be able to look at processes and improve them, and then also no process is going to work successfully in your firm unless you properly manage that change with your, with your team um, and also personally as well. That's going to drive us into those three core processes, and I'll unveil those as we go through the rest of the content. So. Let's keep moving along here. So the overview overall. So what I wanna do is talk about a little bit about how a business is framed and how things happen and how things translate so you can see how it comes together. So classic model for businesses is you go out there and you put up yourself a website. You may do some outbound efforts in order to drive the marketing funnel. Ultimately, that's capturing the prospects. Hopefully they become clients and that those prospects ultimately get funneled down into your sales operation whatever, however you may execute that today. Sales then narrows it down into those who actually become clients. Then you've got to go ahead and onboard those clients uh, in order for them to, to be able to work with them, hopefully on a monthly basis. Maybe it's on a once a year basis, depends on the type of business that you have. And then once you've onboarded, it really goes down to what are you actually delivering? What is the service that you're providing? So one is to get their information, um, get them prepped, maybe get their books up and running. Another thing then is maybe you're doing bookkeeping, maybe you're doing accounting, maybe you're doing CFO advisory services, um, whatever it's core to what you're doing, but it's about the service that, you're ulti that they're ultimately paying for and you supporting them along that journey, and those are intertwined overall. Now, hopefully what you're doing on the back of that is you're driving that funnel further from the, those that are coming in. It is primarily a referral-based business. Um, overall, it should be. Um, again, um, when you put all that great hard work into the service and support, then it comes back into the referral marketing and then cross-sell and upsell from your existing clients, as well as continuing that new sales going in overall. So this is a very basic framework about how it comes together, but it brings up what those core processes really are, which first and foremost, the first one is service and support. And we're going to talk a little bit what that means, but that is different depending on the practice and the clients that you choose. So I'm going to go from it to explain how that, how that plays out, but also how you can drive better efficiencies from whatever service that you typically are trying to perform um, in order to drive the majority of your revenue. So one thing is, again, the services you provide, but then you're taking a step back up that process. It's really about onboarding. So I'll give you guys some context out there um, from all the research that we've done, meeting with you know, now over 5,000 plus firms, the average time to onboard someone takes somewhere between 60 and 90 days. Now, those that are progressive, have really fine-tuned their processes, are doing it on average less than 30 days. And your goal should be doing it somewhere in that three-week to four-week mark. And so onboarding is really critical because it tees up the service, it sets up the relationship, um, and, it, and it lowers the risk for all that effort done on the pre-sale and sales cycle to ultimately translate into revenue as an ongoing client. The third one then is moving up to the top, you know, higher up in that funnel. We're going to talk about the different sales and marketing processes. It's not just going to be one. We're going to talk about several different ones there. Because depending on the type of firm and your focus, um, you, may, you, you may be doing one type versus the other. And so the first one is really on what you deliver. The second one is on the setup of it. And then the third one is, well, how do you expand the pie overall? We will talk about a fourth one. Um, it's kind of the added bonus. And that's really around training. Um, and again, we got to these um, processes by asking a lot of your peers out there um, what were the critical things that made them successful overall. So with that being said, I want to go into this next step, which I think is the, you know, probably the most critical, which is how do you take what you're doing today 
improve upon it, and then implement it inside your firm. Because one is to look at those three core processes, but you need to be in a constant improvement mindset um, and also being able to implement that change. So I put this quote up here from Jessica Daly. She's actually um, the, the, the owner, uh, or director, technically her title, of Accelerate Business Solutions. Um, she was a firm of the future finalist this year, uh, one of the 20 that was announced at QuickBooks Connect. But again, from her standpoint, and what she talked about is efficiency def begins with defining roles. And on that second sentence, or third sentence, she says, the, we found that process mapping each job in the company has allowed us to find the gaps and define those clear roles overall. And it's, you need, I, so when, I, when I've been at the, the various different roadshows that we've done, I would typically ask how many people have documented their processes. And I think the highest count we got was 10% in a given audience, but generally it's just a few that hands that raise. And I urge all of you to document your processes because once you've documented, you can go ahead and improve them um, here going forward. And so in order to ultimately create a well-oiled, um, consistent and high quality machine for your particular practice, it's about creating standardized processes. And so what I've put up here on the left are the 10 steps that I define and how to do process improvement. And I'm going to walk through them through them quickly. If you want a full one hour, you know, talk through this particular uh, point, um, you can go ahead and just search for developing standardized processes at um, the accounting resources on carbonhq.com. But first one is, what are you going to actually improve? And the best way to be able to figure out the process that's most important to improve is think about what bothers you the most. When you wake up in the morning and you, you sit down to start to work on your business, um, think about the clients that you serve, and so forth, what irritates the heck out of you that you know that you could be doing a different or better way? So that's a good starting point because you're super passionate about it and you're ultimately going to take it to the finish line. The other thing is to really think about where you have big gaps or where you feel that you are underperforming based upon whether or not you're properly measuring your processes overall, or you see that there is a bottleneck that exists within the way that you're doing your work. So, you know, do you have, um, where is the bulk of your staff having to spend their time and effort? Um, is, is there um, particular waiting periods that you, you have a lot of static time that's being wasted? Those are processes that you ultimately want to take a look at. Now, Processes, again, if you're by yourself, it's a little bit easier, but if you're in a team, one of the critical things on in the second step there is really having an open discussion and dialogue about what the process is, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because that's part of the change management journey that you need to be on, which is to make sure that it's not just the process that you push and, and push to the organization, because you're going to get resistance. It's about having everyone feel like they've, they've got a part in both identifying the process that, that, that's going to be changed or being able to help improve that process so that they can own it going forward. And so there definitely needs to be have a discussion, not only from just opening up, but you're also going to need that information in order to map it out. One of the biggest keys here that people forget, um, this goes in terms of whether or not you're setting quarterly goals or whatnot for your firm, but you need to understand what, to, what success looks like. And success has measurements. It is not just a binary yes or no, um, but it is a scoring of it um, based upon what you're going to accomplish. So it's, it's, it's necessary to be able to determine what it is that's ultimately got to create better, um, sorry, my dog is in the background barking, um, what success is going to be, and then ultimately what the margins are going to be in terms of, um, in terms of, what you know ultimately is it going to be you're going to do it in faster time um, is it going to lead to a higher quality metric those types of things and then get agreement on by the team the fourth one is really mapping out the process and this is going step by step by how it's delivered the key on that is by mapping it out it helps you determine what processes and what steps you can eliminate and what st what steps you could take a, a look at in a different light and so this requires you working with a subset of the team uh, maybe they're, they're, you identify them yourselves, or maybe the team identifies who they want to represent. And it's mapping out the process, how it, should, how it, how it is today, and any variants that might exist. And the variants are super important because if you understand why people do the process slightly, in slightly different ways, you start to find where innovation can lie and where you can get huge improvements on the process. So 
People don't purposely try to sabotage a process or go outside what the process would do. They do it because they're trying to accomplish something faster in a better way. And so when you're able to uncover why people do it slightly differently from one to another, you start to see you know, where the differences might lie from client to client and where people have found really interesting ways to do it faster, easier, cheaper, and so forth. And then you discuss those variants with that sub team that's doing the process improvement because you want to be able to understand the background and the context because that's how you're able to find out, well, maybe we don't want to do it that way. Maybe we can do it slightly differently in a much more creative fashion to give us even better improvements that we already experienced that someone on the team has already have already figured out. And then you want to review each and every step that you've outlined on whether or not each one could be improved in some way. And I like to do this looking at it from the start to the finish and from the finish to the start. And the reason for that, it's like if you want to do proofreading uh, of any sort of uh, article that you write or, or what you put out there, when you read something backwards, it helps you understand whether or not you've got something misspelled or, or there's a grammatical issue. And so by looking at a process in each individual component, you can start to think about, well, A, do I need this process? B, um, is it done this way because we've always assumed it should be done this way? Or could it be done in a, in a slightly different way or done in, in a process earlier on? And it really starts to uncover where you know you ultimately might be able to, to squash unused, unnecessary steps or to think creatively. And then you rewrite that process out. And again, I like to do process improvements on sticky notes or on a whiteboard because it makes it easy to move things around. But then you want to create that 2B process, the one that you're going to go ahead and try and, and work with your team to roll out going forward. And so that generally is derived from that team, that sub-team that's working on it. And then that is what's used as, is documented as this is the process review is going to go forward. But you can't roll out the process at that point. You've got to actually put it in place um, and test it to see whether or not it really did improve upon what the old process was. And so that's why you're measuring in step three and determining the measures that you're going to, to use to evaluate. And you're going to see, you know, whether it be a time trial with just a stopwatch, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, evaluating it based on uh, the clients and their sort of perceived improvement on it. But whatever it is, you need to measure to see whether or not there was a change and how much of a change there was. And then you can go ahead, fine tune it further, document it, put it in your repository of choice, and then implement it across your organization. And then it's the constant iteration on that overall. So those are those 10 steps to process improvement um, with a little bit of color of, of how you actually do that. And some tips and tricks real quick with that is, I mentioned before, if you wanna choose and, you've never, and you haven't done this before, you start with what bothers you most because you're gonna be the most passionate about it and you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have that immediate need and that irritation off your plate at the end of it. You do want to have, a, if you do, if you're working on a team, you do want to have cross-functional representation because that's also that's going to help you in the change management journey and on the innovation discovery. You need to document everything, um, and that means you're documenting both the past and the future. Uh, we had Heather Satterley um, from Satterley Consulting and Training. She actually was one of the writers of the advanced certification test for QuickBooks Online, and. It was interesting. We talked about document everything. She mentioned that, you know, there were the processes that she had today. She had wished that she had all the different iterations that she had done because it helps her look at that process, what it is, where they came from, where they made adjustments to it, and where they could possibly look at further improvements on that process. So having a, a track record and a history of that is helpful um, in improvement going forward. Create a process map. Could be just using sticky notes. Um, it could be using um, a proper tool for that. There are several out there. Um, could be using Visio. I don't know. But again, use something to help you visualize it. Your processes are living documents. Once you've documented them, you want them in an online document management. It could be Google Docs, um, whatever, whatever it could be in a spreadsheet. I don't know. But when someone needs to improve it, they should be able to do it in the moment and continue to iterate on it as they go forward. Ask why each and every step. And then again, this is a really important one. Uh, when you create a process that you're going you're gonna to use going forward, do not make it so that it's so rigid that um, everyone has to follow it exactly the way that it's been written down because it will fail. When every client that comes in is going to want something slightly differently, every person that drives a project 
does things slightly differently. So you need to allow for some ability to customize that process in order to match the needs of both those who do it and those who are being served by it. Train, 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 train. If you, if you want someone to follow a process that's new, you've got to do all the legwork to make them comfortable with it, understand the context of why it was done, and be able to handhold them through how it's changed. Don't assume that once you dictate this is the way it's going to be done, that everyone's just going to follow it. Don't underestimate that change management. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then again, you want to iterate on it frequently. And again, it depends on how many processes you have, but at least every process should be updated every six months. So again, that is a bit of my uh, primer on process improvement, and it's so critical when we talk about the core process here in a second. And the last, and the last step of, the, of sort of the setup to the core processes is change management. And even if you are by yourself, you have to prepare yourself for that change and mentally be aware and remind yourself of why am I doing this, why is this being put in place, and what should I expect to receive um, as benefits after the fact of change, making the change. Because change is really hard for a lot of folks. Um, people like to keep in a consistent way of doing things. And again, upending that um, does have uh, negative impacts in terms of just, you know, in terms of you've got to invest a little bit more up front to get, get yourself uh, in a sort of well-oiled machinery sort of uh, frame of mind. So quickly, I just want to go through this. And it's been touched in a little bit beforehand. When you're doing anything, again, process improvement is a good example. You need to figure out well, why in the heck are we doing this? Define what it is, communicate it across the team, and be clear what your goal is overall. And so that goes to the second one, goals. It needs to be clear. You need to have an objective. What, why are we trying to solve this? We need to have uh, the measurements of that. So an objective has an underlying written goal that's measurable. Then you have the strategies about how you're going to put this into place, and then each one of the strategies has its own measures of what the change is going to uh, provide um, or, the, or where we're, we're shooting for. The reason why I mentioned the cross-functional involvement, it's all about inclusion. Whenever you're doing change management, you need to have involvement on the what and the how of it because if there's if it's only the how or it's only the, the aftermath of what's been changed, people don't feel like they were included and don't feel like their voice was heard and you get a lot of pushback um, as you roll something out. Talked about this already, but articulation. Um, and so when we talk about process improvement, you need to talk about where we were and where we are going. And that's that as is and to be process documentation. Inside of a firm, if it's a large firm, we see that there's partners, there's managers, and there's doers. Each one of those has a role. From a partner perspective, they're just approving what was being proposed. Manager's job is to be able to drive those processes to be changed and to own the outcomes or the changes that are, de that are determined to be made. And those who are actually the doers in the organization, they are involved in creating, articulating, and proposing, and building those new processes. Buy-in, it's all about buy-in. You need to get buy-in from everyone on the team with the understanding of what the outcome should be overall. And that doesn't mean you necessarily, when you go to somebody and say, look, this is the change we're going to make, and they're just going to be all happy about that change. But it's getting them to understand that their voice has been heard. And if they don't agree with it, it's explaining why the change is being made and having that upfront conversation, that back and forth, um, so it's not um, it's not being you know it's not necessarily tucked aside, but they can get their frustrations out and they can be addressed. And it sometimes it's 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 a you know we're not going to you know we're making the change because of these reasons. I hear you, but you know unfortunately um, I understand that's going to cause this sort of headache for you. But it's for the betterment of of what we're doing overall as a team. Adherence, everyone needs to adopt the change. That includes the partners at the top. Um, and, and they need to be accountable. Everyone's accountable. And then as you go through the journey, it's reminding, it's over communicating why we're doing this, what we're changing, how we're changing it, and how we're making, how, we're, how our progress is. And the last step of this is, and most people don't do this, when you've looked at your measurements and you've made that success that you've been trying to go for, you got to take time to celebrate. And that's cross-functional as well. Because that helps you in that process improvement journey overall. So take the time to celebrate um, when you meet your goals. Okay, so that's our primer today um, on process improvement, change management. It's a good time for us to get our next polling question out there. So <clears throat> which one, so let's get a little sense of, of what people have done out there so far uh, in 2016. 
So um, have you documented your processes? Have you updated and improved them at all? Have you invested any time in change management? Interested in workflow, those types of things overall. And so uh, it's multi-select, should be. Uh, and so go ahead and vote. Again, get those votes in. The faster you get the votes, we can keep moving on because we're going to talk about those three core processes here in just a second. So quickly answer, which of the following activities has your firm done in 2016? Going to give it three more seconds. Three, two, one, and we're going to close the poll. So for those of you out there, we've got, uh, here I'll share the results. We've got improved and updated processes. Only 15% or so have actually documented them. The rest of you, please document your processes. A um, bit more on change management. Good for you guys. And then um, some of you implement workflow and other, you know, over 50% either want to or have. So let's go and move on. If you want to learn more on the processes or change management, take a screenshot of this quick. Those are the webinars that are uh, an hour long uh, detailed discussion around what I just talked about. So again, some, you can go to firmofuture.com. Again, you can go to carbonhq.com to learn more about those particular pieces. Okay, section three. Three processes you might have to, must have to scale. We're going to talk about the first one, service delivery. Okay. So put up here a good quote from Beanstalk Accountants. Uh, Scott Lynch is down there. And on his, you know, the key to a scalable business is a process that works for your practice and making sure that everyone on the team knows it inside and out. I would totally agree with that, which is why you should document your processes. And I love the second line of this. The worst excuse for losing track of a job is not even having a standard process to begin with. I completely and utterly agree with it. Um, it's easy to point the fingers at somebody, but if they're not given a roadmap about how to accomplish what needs to be accomplished and you leave it to be in somebody's head, it's hard to expect them to keep track of it if they don't have a roadmap by which to work from. And so again, please, please, please document your processes. So when we look to, when we talk to firms and when I, when I meet with them one-on-one -on -one and we talk about, you know, what sort of order and again, prioritization on what processes to drive, it comes down to where do you make your money as a business? There are seven different major service types that you can you can be using in, or in, in, in a firm. Um, large full service accountancies may do all these. Um, if you are a single person, uh, uh, let's say bookkeeper, you may only do bookkeeping and accounting, maybe some payroll. But this is the full list of services that can be done. And the key about this overall is to determine what is the order of priority for what you do and how you serve, because that's going to be your order of prioritization in terms of looking at the processes and fine tuning them going forward. And so if primarily you're a tax based firm, then you should start from there and talk about maybe tax planning um, or again, maybe you're doing some specialty tax work. And so if that's the core bread and butter of where you make your money, we're going to start there and we want to get that process documented and fine tuned. So I put this as a roadmap to give you some ideas uh, about what you could be doing uh, and ultimately giving you a starting point to start to focus on on which ones you might want to focus on. And I put this up here. Use something to document your processes. I showed you carbon, but you know, there's all sorts of uh, products out there, spreadsheets. I don't care, but put, put it someplace. And we're an industry that loves, loves checklists. And checklists are fantastic. So what I wanted to do was less talk about a particular process itself that you may use to service, so like an accounting process, but I want to talk about how you represent it in wherever place you're documenting it at. And so that goes down to what are the best rules um, on checklists so that you can ultimately scale that process um, as the firm scales as well. And so um, just as a background on a checklist, they should be precise. They should be efficient and easy to use. A checklist line should be very simple to read and take an action on and should, if it needs more information, have that in the description that's related to it. And again, I'm not going to go into the different types of checklists on there, but most of us do things as a, as a do and confirm. Here's step one, do this, check it off, it's done, versus like a recipe, which is a whole stuff set of stuff. Now, how do you construct checklists? Checklists are really just a set of um, items that are basically tasks and to-dos. And so a task and to-do is basically an active verb with a noun and an object. So my example here is a bad task is to uh, contact Jane. A great task would be to 
phone Jane at one two three four five six seven eight nine zero phone number to ask for onboarding document eleven twenty past past tax document. That is a task that is well formed. I can pick it up in a second. Know what to do. But contacting Jane doesn't tell me actively should I call her? Should I email her? What should I do? Um, it doesn't have the information I need to actually execute on it, nor does it give me the context of what I need. And so you want to keep the checklist item super clear, super simple. And so it might just be um, call Jane at said phone number to get X onboarding doc, and then the description of why that's done and how it fits in the process is sitting in the description. Checklists, I've seen checklists that are 200 in length, way too long. Use um, breakup checklists in a smaller checklist or use, or use an item, like a parent item with sub items on it. And the reason for that is when you check off something in a 200 checklist item, it changes it by 0.5% on completion. And when you look at it, it is a very dissatisfying to only get 0.5% completion as you check something off, but it really doesn't show you where you are in a given process at a high level view. The strategy. There should never ever be more than one owner on any given task or checklist item. If you have two people owning something, the other person, the person who, who one of the two people there is going to assume the other one has it, and the other person is going to also assume that the other person has it, and it never actually gets done. Should always be one throat to choke on a task, a checklist overall, a project, a client, whatever it is. Checklist items are your to-dos. And so um, while you may have a process that runs three months out, as soon as the checklist item is within that one week or it's being, it's being now active, it is immediately a to-do that the person who owns it has to put on their to-do list. You should, again, with your processes, link to a detailed process. Again, we mentioned, mentioned before, you should have documented living processes. They may exist in something like a Google Doc, or spreadsheet, or um, a, a Visio or whatever it might be, but that whole process needs to be properly laid out and you're going to link to that to your checklist themselves and it's a constant iteration battle. Interestingly enough, a checklist is a waterfall set of dates. You have a project that needs to end of December 31st. You start it on December 1st, let's say. There's 10 steps to it. Each step then ladders up to ultimately meet that December 31st time frame. So it's a critical path to get stuff done. However, when something is actually put on somebody's plate to get it done, that task may have a different date. If it turns out that your client is going to be out for a week and you need to get them onboarded, well, you're going to have to start the process a week earlier um, than you typically would in a checklist because, again, you have to deal with the reality of the situation. And so your to-do dates may be different than your checklist dates. I talked about this earlier. Every one of these checklists has to be customizable per client um, and possibly even per staff a bit because of the way that somebody works or someone wants to be worked with. And then always keep an archive. And all, you know the, this, the, the principle of KISS, keep it simple, stupid, uh, should be applied here in all cases. So I want to bring up five key things here for you to take away on checklists. One is, there should only be one owner for everything. Do not have two people own something. And there should be one approver. So again, you may have toll gates in your processes to make sure the work is being done the way it's done. That's owned by one person. Person getting the work done, owned by one person. A checklist can have multiple people on it. One task is done by person A, another task by done by person B, but again, it's not two per each one of those tasks. Typically, you will see that a checklist, 80% of it will work from client to client, and there will be some about 15 to 20% modification um, for the client overall. So bake in that flexibility. Keep checklist items clear, concise, and actionable. They are just like tasks. Link it to a knowledge management system. And again, this is a relay race. When you're working with a client, you have to make sure you pass the baton. If you're done with your thing and it goes to somebody else, don't just assume that they know it needs to be done. You need to properly communicate it, hand it off, and do the transition from step to step to step. We see a lot of times that people don't do that. They just assume and stuff sits there waiting to be done. Nobody knows about it. So, whoops. Quick polling question here. Which of the following services are your primary types of services that you do? Uh, I pulled off audit and I pulled off IT consulting because uh, it only allows you to do five and uh, go to go to webinar. Um, but again, let's just get a sense of the type of firms we have out there. And again, by making you select this choice, I'm telling you this is where you need to look at for your first step along the journey here in terms of your core process improvement. Again, the faster you answer, the faster I move on. Um, almost there. 
give it five more seconds. I wanted to put this up here while we're getting the votes in. I get asked a lot, well, what are the best practices for processes out there? And instead of me walking through each and every one of these, um, we've actually gone to a lot of the firms out there that have done this um, and do it really, really well and asked for their checklists and their templates. And so if you need one, go to carbonhq.com backslash templates and you can download any one of the ones I've listed here. We're putting up more all the time. But again, the ones I listed here was end of month accounting, onboarding a new client, leads, new team member, offboarding. That's an interesting one. Again, you should be firing clients. How do you get them off? So let's close that poll overall. Again, uh, most of you sat in the tax realm. Um, second to that was bookkeeping overall. So um, close the poll. But again, if you want a template, again, I didn't talk about it here because again, it's, it is individualistic to the firm, but I can point you to those. It's a good starting point to look at some of the best practices out there. So let's talk about onboarding. And again, onboarding, best in class, people doing it in 30 days. I had one person that did it always within one day, and that's because they went to the client's site and they wouldn't leave until they got everything they needed and it was set up. It's a bit over the top, but that's what some people, <laughs> that's what one person did overall. Put up a quote here from Kenji Kuramoto from Acuity, which is by the, they have one of the best uh, sales processes. Um, very interesting way that they run their business. Um, but for him, it's, for them, it's about, they wanted to have a rapid growth business. And so they actually changed their organization structure. So they, they had a bunch of generalists, um, accountants that were generalists. And then they did realize that they wanted a bunch of specialists. And so those new roles helped them to scale their business. And one of the roles on that specialty was to have someone dedicated doing onboarding. And I'll explain why in a second. What is on, you know, what is onboarding to, you know, definition? I put the definition up here. My definition of it is when the work becomes routine. So the point that a client come, or a prospect comes in, asking for services to the point that you've already signed the paperwork, you've collected the information, and now you're doing something like bookkeeping on a monthly, sustainable, repeatable fashion. That's the time frame of what onboarding is in my definition. So I broke it up here into five segments. It is not just about data capture. There is much more to it than that, and I'll explain why here. Sorry, there was a question that came up, and it was, what is the URL for checklists? Um, again, I'll bring it up a little bit later, but I'll put it up here for you right now. It's just this overall. I'm going to give it to you all. It is carbonhq.com uh, backslash templates. So that gets you that answer there real quick. Wow. Uh, can't multitask. There we go. Uh, so we're going to go to the first one, pre-work. Again, if you want to onboard really quick, the best way to do that is really have a definition of who you're going after, how you're going to approach it, processes that you're going to use to serve them because it really hits in terms of the value conversation you're going to have um, and trying to train them on what you do and how you do it. And so your pre-work is really helping you, and this goes back to bigger topics that we, we, I can talk about at a later date, which is understanding who, what your niche is or your strategy, your focus, and that really helps you identify ideal clients. The, the more narrow your client base is, the easier it is to onboard because it's consistently the same time and time again, and you don't have a lot of variance. You want to define your engagement. And this is not only for yourself, but also for your client. This is how we operate. This is what we do. These are the steps that we take. This is the time duration it takes to do that. This is what you own. This is what I own. That's the definement of the engagement. Then it's clearly defining and documenting that process so that you know each step of the way. And again, it's no surprises for you or the client. Critical few technologies. We're on, we're on this call. QuickBooks Online You're one of your critical few. There may be certain other things, maybe, you know, maybe smart sheets, you use smart sheets in addition. I don't know, but those critical few technologies are something you want to be able to explain to the client because they may come in with their own notion of it, but you want to be able to dictate what your three to six preferred ways to work are, because again, it minimizes the risk. It's easier for you to manage and it helps you in things like onboarding to do things in less time. And then you've got to create the training and that training is two part. It's for clients to understand what their journey is going to be, and it's for your staff and yourself to understand how it actually operates uh, in real time. That goes to step two, which is first conversation to close. You're going to be leveraging all that pre-work when you are actually doing the value pricing conversation or that value conversation and the selling process up front because you want to be able to explore with the client what they're doing and how they're doing it today, what their goals are going forward, because then you can wrap in and sell your experience 
what an engagement look like because you're then providing them confidence you're the best to do it and you get to the fun stuff which is defining the engagement we're going to do this for you this is what we agreed that's the right thing for us to do here's what an engagement looks like with us here are the steps along the way and you want to and this is the most critical step here setting the expectations up front we're going to come on you sign that paperwork we're going to kick off the first meeting in that first meeting we're going to lay out all the things you need we're going to set a goal of, of, 30, of 30 days to get this done. I'm going to ask you for these things along the way. You're going to provide them back to me in three days or less, whatever the, whatever the, the stipulation is. If you have any questions, you're going to pick up the phone and call me or text me, whichever the way that is. But set up all the expe expectations up front. Walk them through it. The extra effort you spend up front will pay you huge dividends later because when something goes sideways, you can point to the conversation you had before, and it's not this sort of, name game or finger pointing game it's all been discussed up front then we get to the classic onboarding you transition it from the person who's doing the selling to the person who's actually doing the onboarding again in firms where and again to the last bullet point that do this really well they have someone that's dedicated if you are by yourself you dedicate time on your calendar each week to do onboarding maybe once or twice a week and a set block but the problem is people do not set that time aside for new clients because they're always overwhelmed with existing. And the reason why people can get done in less than 30 days is they squash out all the lead time. When somebody gives you something that you asked for, you immediately want to ask for the next thing because they've already got this emotional sense and confidence of completion and you're top of mind with them. And they're more likely to give you the next item immediately versus if you wait three days, you're now at the bottom of the queue and they're gonna to get to it in their own sweet time. So secondly, when you, when you wait to ask for the next thing, you inherently add lead time that didn't necessarily need to be there because you've now waited three days, you can't get that three days back. And the client's not gonna speed up any faster than they were beforehand because you decided to wait three days. And so that dedicated resource allows for you to consistently squash out any sort of inherent lead time that you might add. Set a goal, a path, deadlines, and penalties. This goes to expectation setting. Have an aligned goal with you and the client. We're going to get this done in 30 days. If you don't give me back what I asked for in, within two, three days of when I asked for it, then we're either going to slip the project, the onboarding out, um, which we both lose, or you're going to have to pay a price, uh, more fees for us to do this in order to catch up on the lost time. And the two middle pieces are, are some of the critical ones. If you want information from your client, don't ask for it all at once. If you ask for it all at once, it's too onerous. There's too much stuff there, and they will ultimately push back um, because they just can't get through it. Ask for it one by one. Ask for the easiest stuff first, leading to the harder stuff later in the process because you basically want to build up their confidence and get them to be able to provide things um, consistently and feel comfortable doing so. Secondly, have them validate. Again, this, we, we see this with e-organizers. You can fill out a lot of the information or have assumptions of what that information be and ask the client to validate what that is versus having them fill in the blank. It is much harder to fill in the blank than it is to look at some information to see whether it's right or wrong. So again, those are other things that people do to speed it up. Training. On onboarding, you've got to train the client on what you want them to do. Do not assume that you know for them just to upload a document into your document repository portal is something that they've done. They may not have done that. Show them, step with them in that first time so they understand how they, they should operate with you. Everybody learns slightly differently. Some like to be shown. Others like to try it on their own. Others like to watch videos. You need to figure out what that is for your client and be able to, to work with that sort of pattern. You gotta have a plan. It's better to have a plan up front, but if you don't, you gotta put a plan in place about how you're gonna get them to understand how to work with you and, and what that's gonna be. And schedule time. Um, do a one, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, you know, 15, 30 minutes to be able to teach them what you do. It improves their appreciation for what you do and a higher willingness to pay for it because they will realize that they don't want to do this every day. And then everybody on your team is always training. Last thing is you ultimately got to get the work done. So after onboarding, it goes back to the service process. And then you got to understand what's really valuable. Um, clients don't necessarily need seven years of, of historical data. You think that's valuable, but they don't. They just want to be able to see what they you know, what a budget should be, and that could be based off just two years, three years of data. So, um, you know, how deep do you really need to go? The client owns things; it's their responsibility. 
when you're up front and explaining the responsibilities and why it's a partnership, um, it makes it easier. And train them, if they're going to own stuff, what they got to do. And success isn't until it's routine. If you want to learn more, both on onboarding in depth and even on client collaboration, um, done these talks before. Um, you can go ahead and those are the URLs to either take a screenshot or again, all the materials today can be found uh, in the, it's not the course locker, but um, you, you get, uh, you'll get a link to it as well as you can download it from the GoToWebinar um, emails that you got. So go ahead and move to the next one. Now we're going to talk about the third core process, which is sales and marketing. Okay. Greg Daly from Accelerate, uh, partners with Jessica, put up here um, his quote, you cannot be efficient without having a focused niche. Um, and that helps you on all sorts of things. Marketing is one of them. Sales is, an, is another. But it, that's what helps you create a scalable system. Um, and again, it, it helps you, you know, most, most on the niche, it helps you most, I would say, on that marketing, keeping your you know, cost down, your ROI as high as possible. Um, but it also impacts sales as well. So I break down the marketing and sales into the three processes that I think are important. One is for new clients, so new sales. The other one is the upsell, cross-sell opportunity. And then the last one is referral marketing overall. Um, so I'm going to put them up here what the processes are and a little bit of talking through it. Again, if I was someone that was just starting out, with, you know, or, or just, you know, the easiest one would be the referral marketing because any business you want to drive to new business. The second one is it's easiest to try to drive more sales from existing clients because you invested a lot of time and effort. So upsell, cross-sell would be second, and then new sales would be third. So again, um, give you context and maybe the order of priority. So for new sales, because that's where most people act or talk about, again, um, it's really spurring activity through the different marketing vehicles that you have. Again, we're going to talk about referrals, but you could have inbound, which is search engine optimization. You could have outbound, which might be your newsletters or content marketing, whatever it might be. Now, what do you need to do? When a sales prospect comes through, you, you don't need to be doing something, you know, a super sophisticated sales process. But what you do want to do is you want to be able to qualify any given lead that comes in. Typically, we try to narrow this down to maybe three questions. Um, it could be five questions. But what it is is a quick set of questions for you to understand whether or not you should be investing your time in this particular opportunity. And so you're trying to figure out, do they fit with the type of work that you do and the type of services that you provide? Is the size of the opportunity and their willingness to pay big enough to warrant you spending the time and further and further driving it? And what are you going to do to be able to understand that if they are a fit, the size is big enough, is this one more important than the than one you've already spoken to or you have in the pipeline? Or should it be bumped up in the queue? And so, again, that's maybe on how quickly they want to have services done or, or they need somebody. Is it now? Secondly is how much their willingness to pay and what margin you can drive out of it. And then it might be um, market service fit for what you do. Those are kind of the easy ones. But there's other ways to look at that equation. Then it's really, um, if, it's, if it's prioritized and it's important, it's taking the qualified lead that you have and trying to drive it to close. And so that's where the value conversation comes in. And you're trying to determine what they want done, peeling back the onion to understand the scope of the work that needs to be completed. And that's going back and forth on, on possibly showing your packages, um, having an understanding to narrow into one, and then being able to have a broader conversation. What is the full scope that needs to be done? And you want to document as fully as you can so there's no surprises, especially when you're doing value pricing of work. Then you got to drive to a close. Best practice is if you start from an inbound um, lead that comes in, you should on average be taking no more than 21 days or three weeks to go from first conversation to close of the lead. Um, if you're doing it longer than that, you're investing too much time and the risk of closure is quite high. And so when you've actually had the conversation of what you can do and how you do it, you need to be driving that immediately, literally within the conversation that you're having right then or there, therefore right afterwards. And so you want to be able to get them on the phone and get, and get a signature as fast as possible. Um, and so if you can't do it then, you immediately are scheduling the close meeting. So if I'm talking to you on a Monday, maybe I'm going to get something on the Wednesday. And so best salespeople will make sure that they drive that over the shortest amount of time. Get a signature. 
um, and go use technology to your favor here. Use DocuSign, use um, Practice Ignition, um, whatever it is that you're doing the proposal work and to get the signature. Once you've got a signature, then it moves right into the, the onboarding process we talked about. And so, you know, you don't want to sit there and have that sit on their desk for time. You want to be able to present that digitally and then nag them to get you the signature um, so you can move forward. Close rate. Um, if you wanna get a high close rate, then you should take and look at every single step that you're doing in this process above and squash out any ones that don't, aren't needed. You wanna be able to remove any friction you have with the client. And that's why I said use technology there even for the signature. Again, it should be super easy. Go get a calendaring app. Uh, I use Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y to be able to schedule a time with your with the prospect to make it easy as possible versus trying to ladder in a time on email. Capacity planning is another thing. You only have so much time you can invest on the sales process, so you need to get a visibility of all the leads that you have and the deals and the prioritization of that and when they're gonna close so that you can schedule it with the other work that's going on in your firm. Um, because you don't wanna have someone sign up and then not be able to deliver um, the services that are asked for, um, not on the dates that you promise. Cross-sell and upsell. So give me an example here of what that can be. And again, when you're working with a client, everybody should be selling, um, whether it's the bookkeeper, the accountant, whoever it is, what they're doing, they have, they have an understanding of the books, they have the dialogue with the client day in and day out, and they can see what other opportunities lie. And so they need to be incentivized, pushed, to be able to figure out what they can do more with the client than they're doing today. And so again, if somebody was just doing bookkeeping and it was just really around the data entry, um, bank reconciliation process, then it goes to, well, maybe let's move them up to bookkeeping plus. Let's talk about bill pay. Let's talk about expanding into payroll. Again, what are the logical progression of the services that we're offer already offering? Well, if we're doing bookkeeping and a bit beyond that, then it goes into, well, we probably should move into accounting. Let's talk about reporting. Let's tease you with uh, reporting overall. Again, I got a couple questions on some of the apps I just mentioned. I'll go back and report those in a second. Um, but what's the reporting? Uh, maybe we go into some of the tax work that we could do. And then it goes into, well, okay, if we're doing all that, then we're going to move into advisory. And that's where a lot of the margins fit. So again, this goes into cash flow. Um, could be, you know, what if analysis. And I gave you some examples there. So again, it's progression overall of those services um, and so forth. So again, the calendaring app for those out there, it's calendly.com, check that out. There's some other ones out there as well um, that you can go ahead and use. So that's the cross-sell upsell journey. Now let's go to the last one, which is referral marketing. And referral marketing really is a five-step process. Um, again, I'll, I'll point you guys to each one of these. I've talked to these all in detail, but referral marketing, you need to know whether or not your client was, client was satisfied, because if they are, those are the ones you're gonna try to push. And the best way to do that is using a net promoter score. And it's just a simple question. Would you um, recommend our services to colleagues or peers? If they answer nine or 10 on a 10 point scale, they're a promoter. They go one, uh, zero to six, they're a detractor. And if they're seven to eight, they're in the middle. Anyone that scores nine to 10, you wanna then drive them um, down the rest of this process. The other ones, there's, there's things you wanna do with them as well, but we'll go into it. Then you wanna ask them, you know, and ideally this is face to face, um, you want to be straightforward and blunt, which is, hey, we've just finished this project. Again, doing this in moments of delight. You recommend anyone I can talk to? And then they say, yeah, you know, I know some people. Then get the name. Well, would you please give me their name? Because I'd like to send you an email um, about how we do what we do so that you can pass that along. Or I'm happy to, to reach out to them directly. But get a name. If they can't give you a name because maybe they don't have one, then you're going to try to push them to give you a rating and review online. And that's probably something like the Find a Pro Advisor site so that you get social proof and it helps validate prospects who are looking at you anyways. So if they're going to give you a referral, get the name, get the intro. If you've gotten part of that, immediately by, you know, when you walk out of their office or they walk out of yours, you should have an email in their inbox reminding them of the conversation, asking them to pass along this detail to the person that they, that they recommend. And again, it's just teeing up that conversation for you. If, it's a rate, if they don't have somebody for a referral, then you're driving a rating and review. And it's telling them, hey, go give me, you know, thank you for, for being a, a, you know, a, a preferred customer and, and loving the services that we offer. Can you please help me build my business by going to the Find a Pro Advisor website? Here's the link. Being able to rate our company, 
one to five, whatever you think we've been able to deliver and give some commentary on why we were able to provide the services that we did. And that way you've, you've directed them into one place, you asked them to give you not only the rating, but also the review because the review commentary is so darn important. Um, and then you're able to drive social proof. At the end of that, you want to close the loop. Whichever way they've gone, write a thank you card, send a thank you email. Um, people ask whether or not they should give gift cards and things like that. It's all what, what you think is appropriate. Um, you don't want to pay to play sort of scenario, but you know, whatever is going to be able to drive further, um, further behavior, because again, if somebody refers, they generally will do that more than once. They generally on average will do it three times. Okay. If you want to learn more on the sales process, the upsell process or referral marketing, I've put up links there to some additional webinars that you can go to. Um, again, a bunch of these ones I've actually done at firmthefuture.com, so you can check it there. Um, but they're also available on um, that resource down below there, Carbon. The last one is, and the reason why I throw in here is around training. And again, I know we got to get to the last question. All I'm going to say here is if you want someone to know and respect what you do and increase the value, teaching them what you do and how you do it is critical for them to be able to be more engaged with you. The second side of training is if your processes are only as good as the people that in your firm know how to do them. And so training them, understanding the client, understanding the processes, pays you dividends and allows you to scale because you don't have to be micromanaging, overseeing things at detail. And so we're not talking about it here, but training is the one that was possibly going to be the third process, but turned out was the fourth, but something that's really, really important for you to evaluate. All right. We've talked about a lot. Um, in this in this session, and so I'm going to bring it up to a wrapping it up. We've talked about how all the processes flow together. Again, it starts from service delivery, you need to back up the process to onboarding, and then it hits your sales and marketing. We've talked about how to do process improvement because, again, if you're going to scale, it's about being able to fine tune them over time, but how to also put them in place, which was change management. And then we talked about those three core processes overall, training being the other one. The last and final Polling question of the day is self-serving, but why not? Um, are you interested in carbon? Also like to give good responses in there. My personal favorite is uh, I'd rather watch paint dry. A few of you have answered that. It doesn't hurt my feelings. It's okay. Um, but again, um, maybe I am a nice person, so maybe that one's going to fit for you as well. So let's quickly uh, in three, two, one. Come on, get those votes in so we can close it down. And we're going to close it. So, if you guys had asked for this earlier, um, if you want a template from what others have done and get some examples, go to carbonhq.com backslash templates. You can download your very own um, to, be able to, to be able to use that as an insight on your own process improvement journey. If you want to get more education like this, go to the firmofthefuture.com site. They have been putting up a wealth of content. Um, by the way, the search is great. If you just put in there what you're looking for, you will get a wealth of information served up to you. They've done a fantastic job on rebuilding that site and putting so much information up there. For those of you that are looking to expand on your journey, again, I just we just stopped doing the Firm of the Future. We just finished the one last week or this week. Um, but check out Fundamentals Training if you're not familiar with QBO. If you are, then you should be doing certification. And if you're already certified, um, then go to the advanced certification. They've got online and there are live courses in person through uh, January for the live stuff. If you want more information, we just launched our own mag, you know, we have our own magazine edition two is out. It's really about transforming your practice of which part of what we talked about today uh, is interesting there. Want to say, uh, so I'm from Carbon. So if you want to check out Carbon, it's carbonhq.com. But um, all this is brought to you by Intuit, obviously. Um, and so check out Intuit as well. From myself, I want to say thank you overall, um, and uh, my information is up there if you have additional questions.